Gator fans, what a night in Gainesville. You guys showed up, showed out. That was an experience. I'm going to talk to you about the good, the bad, the ugly of this game and what it means for the future. All right, first of all, we've got to talk about the atmosphere. Pat yourselves on the back because the swamp was the swamp of old. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I heard it that loud. It was every bit as loud as it was when we played Alabama a couple of years ago. But honestly, it might have been Auburn 2019. It's been a while since the stadium was rocking like it was last night. And it was rocking from the first whistle to the last whistle. And it visibly affected Tennessee. We saw penalties that were solely because of the noise inside the stadium. We had the LED lights that were actually fully functional this week when we saw the orange and blue chants and sang to Tom Petty. Those were going on. Really, really cool addition to the stadium. But you guys, there is not a better atmosphere on Saturday night in the fall than the swamp. And you guys showed why last night. It was so cool to watch the packed stadium, everybody fully in it, bought in. And you know, something that I was talking to a friend about last night is it's actually really hard to keep the stadium loud the entire night when you have the lead from pretty much the beginning. And that's what happened to Florida. Obviously we missed that field goal. Tennessee goes up by seven, but after that, Florida scores and never really looks back. So when there's not a moment where the game is in jeopardy, sometimes it's hard to keep that intensity up for four quarters. But Gator fans, you did it. The stadium was so loud. And I promise you there is not a better venue in college football. Let's talk a little bit about the game itself. Florida's offense We stuck with the run. We talked all week on this channel about how important it was to establish the run. We've talked to you since the summer about the fact that Montreal Johnson and ETN are the best one-two punch in the country. We actually had John Reed on earlier this week, the Tennessee uh, radio guy who told us that Tennessee had the best running backs in the SEC and that Florida's weren't very good. Clearly, he was wrong. This channel was right. Florida does have the best one-two punch in the SEC, but the most important fact about that is they were used correctly last night. Florida established the run, they controlled the clock, and they didn't look back, right? They continued to run. They had the lead all night long, which is honestly what allowed us to continue that ground and pound, but we knew that that would be the easiest path to victory. Tennessee runs an up-tempo offense, so Florida was going to need to slow it down because they weren't going to want to get into a shootout. They did exactly that. They also didn't give themselves too many third downs, and when they did, we didn't shoot ourselves in the foot with procedural penalties or poor play calling. The other thing that really stood out to me was the offensive line play. They played a lot better. Getting Kingsley Iguakin back was huge for the Gators. Tennessee had a really strong defensive line. We heard about them all week leading up to this game, and Florida's offensive line held their own. I think that there was some serious growth tonight between the offensive line and really establishing that two to one pass to rush, or excuse me, run to pass ratio. That's the ideal Florida offense this season. That is what is going to give us the easiest path to victory in these games. And it's the way this offense is built. And it was really exciting to watch Billy Napier do a much better job play calling than we've seen this season. That offensive line hold their own. Those running backs really get to shine. And honestly, Florida's other weapons had a great night too. But how about Graham Mertz? Listen, lies were told about this man this offseason. Not by us, not on this channel, but by the national media. Three games into the season, and he's not only managed games effectively, but he's shown some really good decision-making and some great throws in the process. And man, is he tough? He has taken hits this season, and he just keeps on trucking. He, I think he has great down the field vision. And I really think he is a good 
decision maker. We've talked a lot on this channel about the fact that Florida only needs Graham Mertz to be a game manager. They don't need him to win games. They just need him not to cost us games. I honestly think he's been better than a game manager so far, but the most important thing is that he hasn't cost us. He's played smart. That's the kind of quarterback Florida needs. They have such talented running backs that that's what they need to do. Feed them, right? We've got talented wide receivers. Pearsall is a stud. Trey Wilson is really coming into his own. Caleb Douglas, man, we spread the ball around last night. There are just so many weapons that Mertz doesn't need to make it happen himself. He just needs to effectively manage the game, and he is doing that. Let's talk a little bit about defense. How about that intensity, y'all? The pursuit of that defensive line and the linebackers is starting to show flashes of greatness. Listen, there is still a lot of room for growth, but man, the future is really, really bright. Our secondary showed its youth at times, but listen, there are a lot of athletes there who I really expect to continue to get a lot better, and they showed flashes as well. There was also a lot of gang tackling, and this is something I kind of want to explain a little bit. When, when tackling is coached, it's not always the first person that gets to the receiver or the running back or the quarterback to make the tackle that actually does. Sometimes that first person's job is to slow them down while the heavy pursuit happens from other players and, and those players gang tackle and wrap up. And that is something that Florida has been missing the last few years. If the running back bounces off the first tackler, there's nobody there for backup. This has really improved this season, but I think last night was the best that they've been so far. We aren't whiffing on the initial tackle, but that's allowing guys to get there. The pursuit is there. They're going to help. Gang tackling is really important, and that is something that we have seen really improve. Linebackers were good last night. Florida's defense looked good. I have probably not been this excited about a Florida defense in – Five years. This team is headed in the right direction. And let me tell you about Austin Armstrong, okay? Watching him on the sidelines is so much fun. This is exactly the shot in the arm that this team needs. I think he's going to end up being the best hire that Billy Napier makes during his tenure here at Florida. I think at some point, unfortunately, probably in the, you know, three-year-ish, you know, window of time here, he's going to be a head coach somewhere. I think he is so young, so passionate, but watching the players respond to him when he gets up in their face and he celebrates with them and he gets on them on the sidelines is really a thing of beauty. This is what this Florida team needed. This intensity comes directly from their defensive coordinator. Austin Armstrong is a hell of a pickup for Billy Napier. I'm pretty sure this is the best guy that he's recruited out of a long list so far during his time at Florida. Now, listen, I said I was going to talk about the bad and the ugly. All right. First, I want to talk about special teams. But before I do that, I want to tell you what I did pregame. I got a chance to go over to the Melden Law tent. It is set up right in front of the O'Connell Center where all the action is taking place. There's music pumping. They have a prize wheel spinning. The line was just out the door for people that were interested in trying to win all the things that they were giving away. And Melden Law is the official injury firm of the Florida Gators, and they need to be your officially official injury firm as well. I'm going to go by their booth before the Charlotte game. They are celebrating Tom Petty weekend because, of course, they were Tom Petty's attorney in town. So make sure you come by and see me. This week was really fun, and I am sure next week is going to be just as good. All right. I told you I was going to talk about the good, bad, and the ugly. Let's talk about the ugly. Special teams, fix it, okay? This was miserable. And honestly, it had the opportunity to really change the tone of the game. Thankfully, Florida's defense was just too intense. Florida's offense was too good. to, And they were able to overcome kind of the, you know, the miscues of special teams. But obviously, Adam Mahalik misses that first field goal. He misses that extra point. He was replaced by Trace Mack, which... 
tip of the hat to Napier for making that game adjustment because it needed to happen. Trey Smack goes on to score five points. So it was an important move, but I watched Adam Mahalik closely. Kicks were really low. So that means just the slightest push up the middle can get a block. But not only is that risky on its own, on that extra point, we only had 10 guys on the field, which if you've got a kicker kicking with a lo really low trajectory, you're not doing him any favors when you don't have enough people out there to help make sure that blocks don't happen. But, you know, it's a pattern for him. His kicks are low. But the surprising thing about that is I'm, I'm, I don't understand why I didn't make that change in practice. His, his kicks have been low every game we've seen this season, which means that's probably exactly what's happening in practice as well. So I am interested, surprised, slightly concerned that that wasn't a move that was made earlier because Trey Smack looked better. He looked he looked solid. His kickoffs have been great all season, but last night they went into the back of the end zone every single time. There were no returns. That's exactly what you've got to be looking for if you're Florida. And then he got the job done when his number was called on field goals and extra points. I assume that this is a move that will stick. Um, kicking is a really hard position. It is a one-man show within a team sport, but it was a necessary move. And I do appreciate the fact that Napier was willing to make that move mid game. And had he not, this game could have turned out differently because mixed ex missed extra points, missed field goals. Those are huge momentum swingers. And thankfully the crowd and the rest of this team were able to keep that momentum on Florida's side, but that is risky for sure. And then, you know, punting, Krasha had a bad night. He is a good punter. He's had a rough start to the season. There's a few things that he, you know, is doing technique wise that he probably needs to clean up. But I'm less concerned about that because we've seen his skill set over the last couple of years. We know that he's a solid punter. He just needs to uh, get out of this little funk that he's in. But other than that, the rest of the special teams were pretty, um, pretty good, right? I just... The kicking game is something that can cost you in close games. So Florida really needs to spend some time and effort there to improve because this isn't the type of team that's going to overwhelm you and score, you know, 50 points a game. So they're going to need every point that they possibly can. You don't want to get into the red zone and walk away with nothing. And that has happened to Florida multiple times this season because of the kicking game. You also don't want to lose a close ball game because you missed an extra point, which in college should be a gimme. All right. Enough about special teams. Let's talk a little bit about the head ball coach. This feels like a pivotal win for Billy Napier. It's his first win against a traditional rival. And honestly, it kind of feels like the Gators have a new lease on the season. They're 1-0 in the East. They're 1-0 against their rivals. And honestly, after watching all of the other teams on our schedule yesterday, I feel like Everybody looks beatable if Florida plays the way that they're capable of. Georgia needed to, to go into the fourth quarter to beat South Carolina. Florida State barely hung on against Boston College. I mean, we don't play Alabama, but Alabama didn't look good against USF. The schedule and then also the SEC seems really wide open at this point. And I, listen, I'm not predicting that Florida is going to run the table and make it to the SEC championship game or anything crazy like that. But I do think if Florida had lost this game, it becomes hard to find wins on the schedule. But with Florida having won this game, it honestly kind of makes the whole schedule open up to you as possibilities. There's nobody on this schedule that looks so intimidating, so unbeatable that I'm willing to say, okay, no matter what, that is a loss. Chalk it up. If this team plays like we saw them play last night, they are capable of hanging with anybody on the schedule. This was a big one. It was a big win for the locker room. And honestly, I think the fan base needed it too. I think it's the shot in the arm that everybody was looking for. And this team has the ability to win some ball games as this season goes on. And the good news kept rolling last night as the Gators picked up their first commitment in the class of 2025, four-star Waltez Clark. He is a running back out of Plant High School here in Tampa, four-star guy. 
word on the street is there might be some more coming soon. So, you know, make sure you subscribe to this channel because you know if somebody commits, we are going to have a video on it. Overall, this was a fun game to watch. And I am really hopeful for the future of Florida football. I don't understand how you see what we saw last night and you are not jacked about the foundation being laid at Florida. I think we are seeing the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. I went down on the field after the game last night and I got to sing the alma mater with the band and the team and the cheerleaders and you know lots of former players were, were down there high-fiving each other and hugging, talked for a couple of minutes with Brandon Spikes and he said, Allie, these guys really listen to me. And he is so jacked to be around these kids, to get to influence them. And he's like, you know, I watched the film a lot this week. He's like, we could have beaten this team by even more. I knew this win was coming. I knew we were going to win. He's like, we're going to surprise some people this season. He is so excited about that linebacker room, about that defense as a whole. He is 100% bought in on Austin Armstrong. Chris Doring texts me before the game even happened because remember, if you watched my video with him, he promised he would text in his score prediction. By the way, it was 27-24, but he also said, I've watched tape on Tennessee and I've watched tape on Florida. Florida can beat this team and it might be by even more than this. So watching these former guys buy in, understand what Napier is doing there and really get on board is so cool to see. But what Florida needs to do now is capitalize on this. They have to continue the progress, which Remember, progress isn't always linear, but they have a huge opportunity in two weeks. They can go to Lexington, remove all doubt about who is one of the top teams in the East. And listen, I also think that beating Tennessee probably gets rid of that Utah sting a little bit. But if Florida loses to Kentucky, that will sting. That will bring back that Utah pain. That will sting. We need to go do it on the road a place that's been tough for Florida to play the last couple of years, bring home the victory. And listen, we remained high, although we were also tough on this team after Utah, but we stress that what you saw on the field out there is not what you will continue to see. And massive shout out to this team for bouncing back. Massive shout out to this staff for coaching so much better. Their adjustments over the last couple of weeks have been great. Over the last week and a half, we've spoken with several former player stars and several guys who were on Swamp King. If you missed any of those, do me a favor and click any video on the screen right now.